Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's understand software architecture or system design for stock exchange. And this system design is also holds good for cryptocurrency or forex trading as well. Thanks a lot for all the support until now and uh, in future as well. If you like the content on this channel and if you would like to share or buy a cup of coffee for me, you can do so by joining the channel. Uh, in return, I have custom emojis for Throw Dummies and also I'm going to feature your name in the end of the videos which I'm going to upload in future. And thanks a lot for the support. We can use this system wherever we have to match the supply to the demand or vice versa. So here are the requirements for our system and this is the goals of our system design. So the requirements which we want to cover in this system design is users should be able to buy and sell stocks on this platform. The second one is real-time price update information because we need to uh, keep on sending the real-time price information to the users for the fact that user will be looking at the price fluctuation and then he is going to place an order to buy or sell. So it has to be real-time. And the third one is we should have basic functionality like look at all the stocks which he owns and also the order history or information. And the fourth one is risk management. We have to have our system which analyzes the risk before executing the order matching. And uh, what are the goals of our system? So the first one is we have to process at least you know, 0.1 million orders per second. Um, second one is thousands of stocks or registered companies are in the platform. So we have to process orders for all of them with low latency. And the third one is geo-specific. We don't have to design the system to cater users from all over the world because usually the exchanges are specific to our country uh, even though there are users from other outside the country it's fine our goal here is to design the system specifically for our users in a specific geo and the fourth one is low latency we have to process this order matching as fast as possible it could be in an around 300 milliseconds something like that and the fifth one is high availability or scalability wherein this system should be always available for users to place orders to buy or sell and also the system should be able to add more companies or stocks into the platform and keep on scaling linearly. First, let's design the core component of our system that is matching engine. But before understanding the matching engine, you need to understand what exactly stock exchange does. A stock exchange is a place which is usually a regulated place where people come together and then they have something to buy and something to sell and the matching engine is going to match those two together. And how does it look like? It usually looks like this. If you see, this image is for the Reliance um, stock which has these many orders to, be, um, to bid or buy and uh, the right side shows uh, the orders to be sold. And this one is the screenshot taken from the cryptocurrency exchange where people want to trade bitcoins. And it all boils down to this one called as order book, which usually looks like this, where in this example, we can see that there are four columns. The buy quantity is the number of shares waiting to be bought. And the buy price is the price which a buyer is willing to pay for this particular share. And the sell price uh, is on the right side is the price which a seller is quoting for a share. The set quantity is the number of shares he want to sell. So in total, we have around 500 shares waiting to be bought at a rate of 5,250 and we have 1,650 shares waiting to be sold at 5,252. So now let's design our matching engine. So the characteristic of our matching engine should be, it should be able to add an order it should be able to cancel the order if I don't want to buy or sell. And it should be able to split an order. That means that if I want to buy uh, 10 stocks and if nobody is selling 10 stocks on a whole, um, our matching engine should be able to buy in a split or whatever it can. And it should be able to match, obviously. And the second one is it should be um, able to do all of these actions much efficiently. Ideally, it is always good to do it in order of one or better in log n time. And it should do uh, everything in reliably. Um, so how does the matching engine work? It's not really complicated. It's very simple. Consider uh, you have these orders to buy, okay? 
usually people buy try to buy uh, you know uh, the shares or the stocks or any commodities at cheap price uh, so the winner is who wants to buy at the higher price so he's going to stand out right because anyone who is trying to sell something he doesn't want to sell cheap so usually the sellers as well want sh try to sell it with higher price but the people who stands out in sell queue is one who wants to sell it cheaply so the buy uh, order list will be sorted in the decreasing order where the buyer with higher price or the buyer who wants to buy at high price will stand out okay here in this case uh, there are a couple of orders or people who wants to buy some stocks and here someone want to buy an, an order with uh, price of ten dollar and he wants to buy five stocks and here uh, with price of nine dollar he wants to buy ten in this guy with the price of eight dollar he wants to buy five stocks and in sell queue there are a lot of orders here and we want to um, sort this in increasing order and this one in the decreasing order so here the one the guys who's who is are the orders which stands out is the one who wants to sell cheaper so in this case the orders are there are order with eight dollar and five quantity nine dollar and five quantity and nine dollar five quantity nine dollar five quantity because no one wants to really sell it for cheap right because most likely the price is always same or it will be always higher so when we sort it in the uh, increasing order all the all the orders which are selling at really high price will go in the end the orders who wants to sell it with a cheaper price will come in the front in this case uh, the the guys or the orders who wants to buy at higher price will come in the um, starting of the list here so now how to match it it's very simple it's just like the array elements matching that simple so what we have to do is take the first order um, from this list and then try to match from the starting of the sell list so ten dollar and five so someone wants to buy five shares at ten dollar price but someone is also selling um, five shares with eight dollar price now it's a definitely a good match even we are getting for two dollar cheap now we can match this because the quantities are also matching that means that this and this can be matched so the the buyer who wanted to buy at ten dollar he is actually getting it only for eight dollar and these two are matched and we can execute this consider we execute it so i'm going to remove this from the list okay now those two orders are gone and who is standing out here so there is a guy who wants to buy at nine dollar and ten stocks and someone selling some stocks with nine dollar price and five quantity now we can definitely match this and uh, how do we match it is this one and this one get matched okay and the problem here is the quantity now he wants to buy 10 and here there is an order where the guy wants to sell only five uh, shares only but there are a couple more orders here where you can buy from but we can't do really match like that what do we do is we only purchase five stocks from here okay and then we can either update this to five or other strategy is totally remove this and then re-add it into this list so it will come back here with um, you know nine dollar and five why it will come back is every time when the new order comes into the list we will always be sorting in the descending order and here we always sort it in the increasing order so the same order which was split comes back and sits in the front of this list and we can match it now so now this and this will get matched and these two can be executed okay and these two are executed and similarly we can keep on executing and this list will keep on burning and as and when the new order comes in the list will also be inserted with the new orders like say someone wants to buy at say ten dollar twenty shares and if there is something we can always match now ten dollar nine dollar you are getting one dollar cheap you can keep matching and then executing so what are the data structure we can use to do this so first one is you can use list and do this the second one is you can use link list and the third one is you can use heaps okay now in link list you can keep the order of this list in increasing and decrease because we don't have to sort it because when we start uh, usually we start from one order and then when we keep on appending we can always uh, check and then insert it 
And um, the same thing with the list as well. We start with empty list, and then as and when the entries are inserted, we keep on searching for the proper place where that order should be inserted, and then we keep inserting based on the price. Now, the time complexities, you know, right? In, the, in this case of list, um, the insertion, deletion uh, will all be order of n, but in case of access, it will be order of 1. But in case of linked list, it will be uh, in order of 1, where this is the ideal candidate where you can use. And also you can use heaps where you can use max heap and min heap. So in this case, you can use max heap because we always want the, uh, the, the order with the highest price. So we can use max heap here and we can use min heap here. And then we can do perform this in log n time as well. Couple of things to remember here. We need to make all of this operation in memory. There is no escape to that. The reason is we want to perform all of this so efficiently. As soon as we write this into database, uh, this list into the database or into the disk, we can't really need function um, uh, efficiently or we can't really process thousands of order, millions of orders per second. So key takeaway is we have to consider to do the whole thing always in memory. And the second thing is we need to consider that these data structures or whatever we are doing should be serializable because we always want to keep this state somewhere periodically. We want to take a backup and then keep it in the cache. So in case of our matching engine crashes or the machine where this matching engine is running crashes, we can go back to that persistent storage and we can populate the list which we had and all the orders in it so we get back to that state. So you can think of the whole thing as a state machine where it does all of these things. So the next thing we need to understand is what are the information which we need to capture for a specific order. If it, if it was a linked list, in that case, in each node, what are the information we need to uh, save? Or if it was a list, uh, in that case, list of object or list of dictionary or list of people, what is the information we want to capture? So the first thing is we need to capture the ID of the order. And the next thing is the price of the order at which we want to sell or buy. Um, the quantity of the stocks or, or um, uh, the shares which we want to buy and the status of that initially queued. And once we execute it, maybe we can change it as executed. And once we delete it, we will not need the status anyway. But if you want to have any other use cases, you can use that. And of course, uh, metadata where if you want to st store any other extra information. Um, so this could look like uh, if you're using list, it will be looking like it's either struct or dictionary, or it could be even tuple. Um, so it will be looking like this tuple with only values in it, uh, something like that. Or if it was a node, uh, we'll have all of these keys in it and you're basically linking it all together. Let's understand the system design diagram. In here, you can see there are users and there is HFE. Users are like any normal user who uses UI to interact with the system. Whereas HFT basically uses API calls directly. Uh, what does HFT stands for is high frequency trading. What happens here is the companies or individual persons will usually own a couple of servers and they know sophisticated algorithms or machine learning techniques to identify when to purchase an order and when to sell it. Usually, uh, as a users, what we do is we uh, see the information on the UI and take a decision. But in this case, HFT consumes all the price changes and how many stocks were sold and bought, all of this information. And based on that, oh, the algorithms decide when to place an order and when to sell those stocks for the profit. Usually companies make a lot of money, like crores and crores of money using HFT. So that comes to the first entry point for all our APIs is API Gateway. The HFT might be placing a call here or users using the UI or mobile apps could be placing calls to HTTP um, REST API calls to API Gateway. So what is the functionality of API Gateway? So API Gateway takes all the API calls from the clients and HFT, um, basically all of them are clients. And then um, this API Gateway routes them to appropriate services. 
Uh, here, I have only shown um, the accumulator and risk management system, but internally, they could be having n number of uh, microservices they want to uh, make call. Um, in this case, just, just for your understanding, API Gateway will mainly perform some of the actions, like uh, protocol transformation, wherein all of these API Gateway are wherein all of these APIs are uh, exposed using HTTP, but internally they might be using some other protocol. It could be RPC, um, it could be um, another REST call, or it could be anything, it doesn't matter. Uh, in here, usually um, all the API will be impacted using HTTP or HTTPS, um, and inside it could be only HTTP. So all the security layer will be dropped here. Uh, there could be a, a firewall as well um, in, in, in the front. That is a web firewall um, or WAF, you can call it as. Um, once the request is sent from API Gateway, it goes through uh, Accumulator. Um, what happens in Accumulator is all the orders are given a sequence number based on a lot of different criteria. For, for your understanding, all you have to understand is when the order comes in, it needs a unique ID. The unique ID is basically assigned at this point of time. Um, and you could be thinking, why in the world we are assigning unique ID over here? Why not when we save in the databases? Uh, because you will understand a lot of our functionality over here is done all in memory without using database. So we need a unique identification uh, number, so that will be happening here. So we will basically assign a unique ID for any order request. It could be buy or a sell order. We will assign a unique ID over here. And then that order information will be sent to risk management system. Uh, or it is also called as RMS usually. Um, it is, uh, what it does is it makes sure that order is safe uh, to be entered into the whole system. And there are so many checks, um, which are mostly to check if the order is within the predefined parameters of price, size, capital, um, et cetera. Um, there are, I, I, so these are the list of um, risk management usually um, any stock market will do for any given order. Um, I will be posting some of the links in the description. You can go and read all about it. Um, um, so once uh, the order passes through the risk management, if it is safe to be processed, that order will actually go to the router. What happens in the router is um, based on the kind of stock you want to sell or buy, it will be redirected to one of the queue. So we'll be having n number of queues, uh, which is equivalent to the number of companies we will be handling. So if, suppose, we are handling 1,000 companies uh, in our system, um, obviously we'll be having 1,000 stocks to handle. So there will be 1,000 queues over here. So all the requests, say for example, all the requests for Google stock will be redirected over here. All the orders, uh, you know, buy orders and sell orders for Tesla will be redirected over here. So at any given point of time, in any of the queue, only similar kind of stocks will be there. So this router could be anything. Um, you could implement using Kafka streams if you're using Kafka queue. Um, otherwise, if you're on AWS, maybe SNS can also act as a um, router based on your routing key. These queues could be SQS or it could be Kafka as well. Um, once our order is placed over here, inside here, and this is picked up by our matching engine. We have already discussed how we match it. It is a simple algorithm which runs completely in uh, memory. So the idea over here is, so co consider if you have um, three queues, so there will be one virtual machine per queue, okay? So this VM is responsible to handle Apple, and this is responsible to handle Google, and this is responsible to handle Tesla. So this will be having one process, which will be reading from the queue 
and then matching by using two arrays. One is for buy and one is for sell. So as we discussed the algorithm, it's the same algorithm or a matching engine which will be running inside this virtual uh, machine, which will be using heaps or linked list or whatever array and keeps on consuming from the queue and then matches it. Or if you have uh, very less orders per second, what you could do is uh, you can just have a couple of virtual machines and then um, say, for example, where is this one? Suppose uh, if you're handling very less traffic or orders per second, you can have a couple of virtual machines and you can run um, you know, one or more instances of matching engine in, in the same virtual machine and you could be consuming from multiple queue, queue, queue. So say for example, Tesla, Google, and Apple, you might be consuming all of that into same machine in different processes instant you know different processes each instance of matching engine will be running here and then they will be uh, executing in the same machine um, but it all depends on how you want to design it it's okay um, it, it based on the requirement and uh, traffic um, so the idea here again is uh, we so any at any given point of time we need two matching engine instances per stock or two matching engine processes per stock and they should be deployed in uh, different machines and different data centers. Uh, in this case, let's see, uh, for Google, we'll be having active matching engine over here and also a passive matching engine over here. Uh, why do we need that way? Because we need to have a high availability and also reliability. If for some reason, if our active matching engine fails, then immediately the passive matching engine will take over and starts processing uh, the orders. And then it does all the things which active um, matching engine would have done. We will be needing Zookeeper here uh, because we need someone to take care of who is the active engine and it has to do its uh, other responsibilities. Um, in, in usual case, what happens is if both of these engines, like active engine and passive engines, are always up and running, um, then both cannot be updating into the databases. Only the active engine should be updating all the data into the database and backups and everything. So we need uh, these systems to understand who is the active uh, matching engine because both will be running. They don't have an idea of am I the active matching engine. So Zookeeper will basically help you to identify who is the active matching engine. Zookeeper has a concept called sequential Xenos um, and also epiphemeral uh, Xenos. What this is a short living um, Xenos it only have an entry of a given server when there is always an active connection from any machine. In this case, um, our epiphemeral uh, Xenor will have two um, entries, one for the primary active matching engine and one for the passive ma you know, matching engine. In the sequential node, um, whoever registers first, they will have an entry and the second will be having. So the first one is always the active instance. If Suppose the active machine get disconnected, then this will go away. So the second will become active in that case. So th this will not be there until unless it comes back again, and then the ID will be here, and that will be the passive. Um, and also one more interesting thing you need to know is both of these matching engines will be active, active. That means both will be consuming, okay, both will be consuming the messages which is sent from this router to this group all at the same time. That means that everything is done over here in the same time. It could be a little bit of difference in the time or it could be same, but basically the idea over here is whatever this pass active matching engine is processing, in the same time the passive matching engine is also processing. The only difference is it will not be writing or sending any output to the underlying system, but the active 
uh, matching it will be, will be keep on sending. Uh, why do we have to do that is, uh, if this goes down, this passive matching agent should take over immediately, so it is already in the same state of the active matching agent. So this kind of design is needed because we are doing everything in memory. So that's the reason why we need um, both of these active and passive matching engine to keep on performing the same things. So what happens later? Um, uh, once the active uh, matching engine figures out a perfect match for uh, buy order in the sell selling array or linked list, it what it does is, um, yeah, not here. It actually sends a message to another router saying that I actually found a matching order and then it is sent to a lot of different partitions. Um, so in case of Kafka, uh, the n number of threads or n number of nodes in the consumer side will be having n number of partition. You can design um, here as well something like how we did it here, um, like you can have individual queue for each stock or you can do it as a partition and only uh, this server consumes every stock. Uh, what What is the uh, idea of the primary data server uh, is it basically computes um, the stock ticks. Uh, stock, stock tick looks like this. It is uh, simply the representation of a minimum, um, or a representation or measurement of the minimum upward or downward movement in the price in this uh, stock exchange. Um, this server, once the order is matched, um, it receives the information about the order or the trade which has happened, and then it is going to uh, convert the price changes into the tick. And that changes will be written into RDBMS. And um, the idea in the database is that this RDBMS is sharded. Um, you can shard it into shard by stock. So basically you'll have um, one shard per stock. So this could be Apple shard, this could be Google shard. So you will be maintaining um, thousands of shards. Or if your data is not too much, you can use hash um, sharding or any other strategy. Uh, it's up to you. So usually it's a good way to shard by the stock itself. So you have uh, all of the specific stocks data in one shard. And it will be easier to scale, and you can have more number of writes and reads achieved in the same shard itself. And also, this primary data server is going to write into the time series databases, which will be used to render the graphs um, uh, like um, time, the, the price uh, variation at ev any given point of time, and, um, and, and something like that. So time series are really good in that. Uh, so who is going to consume that data is uh, the UI and the um, front-end application needs to show graphs like this one. Uh, so it, you always need time series databases. It is not really a good idea to use RDBMS for that pattern. Um, and also all of this information is also consumed by your stream processing engine where you can do a lot of other um, streaming processing like fraud detection, other machine learning, whatever you want to do. Basically, you'll be having a, you'll, you will be having a stream processing over here. Um, so I guess um, we did a one cycle of, of how an order starts its uh, journey from an API gateway into risk management router, and it goes to queue. From the queue, it goes to active matching engine. From matching engine, it comes to router and here, and then saves and everything. So meanwhile, this primary data server will be, um, will can talk to this payment system and deduct the amount or money from the user's wallet or account once the matching is done. And that information is also updated over here, okay? Um, so we need a payment, payment system. That itself is a big system. Uh, I don't wanna talk about it now, um, where if the user wanna add some money, you he can actually make this API call and redirect it to bank or whatever it is. So he will be loading all the money into the payment wallet. 
So this system will basically take care of that. Um, and you can also see that the UI is coupled with CDN, uh, or the APIs can be this APIs can be coupled to the CDN to cache some stuff, like like the graphs I showed you here, uh, because this data is mostly once it is there, it is always um, historical data, so you don't need to really query uh, the time series database all the time. So you can cache that as well. So the other important thing we need to discuss is how the reliability of this matching engine. We already spoke about passive and active engine. What happens in certain cases that both machine is down? In that case, how the things work is on a specific duration or interval, like say every one minute once, uh, data in the active matching engine will be dumped into uh, you know, Redis or any storage engine. Uh, the idea here is, um, as I already mentioned in the algorithm, um, your data structure, whatever you use in your algorithm, should be serializable, okay? So that way, uh, you will be dumping all the recent data into the snapshot. Um, so, in on the worst in the worst case, if both matching engine is down, so when they come back, they can read all the latest, uh, the last known state of the machine from here, and um, and and that way you will get back all the order orders which were there already in the order book. Um, and one more thing you also need to uh, understand is Kafka does support um, transactions and uh, manual acknowledgements, which you can actually, manual acknowledgements and transactions, which you can actually use it to um, build your matching algorithm as well. That way you can uh, make it, make your system more robust. Also, as and when you receive your uh, order in the active engine or passive engine, uh, you can also write a copy of order into a Cassandra. Uh, this is not really the job of a matching engine. There could be one more thread which is running um, that could keep on writing into the Cassandra. Uh, so that way, uh, after you get all the latest information from the snapshot, you can query the um, the remaining order information from the Cassandra and then load it back to uh, your matching engine memory so you have the latest state available. Uh, I mean, here there is a lot of different strategy you can use it. Uh, somehow you need to persist the latest known state into Redis and then get back that information. So that's about it. Um, I guess I've covered most of the information you need. Um, the, the other things to understand here is this primary data server is also sending information to the pop servers. So what pop servers does is they are basically um, providing the updates to the users or HFT in real time, like basically they broadcast uh, using WebSocket or using uh, you know, TCP IP or UDP ports. Um, the idea here is um, you should be able to send the price changes or ticks as soon as possible to the end users because uh, HFT is high frequency trading where they will be deciding what stocks to purchase or sell in you know in in terms of 10 milliseconds um, precision so they need to know as soon as possible um, so they will be listening to these pop servers. Uh, there are other strategies as well. In, in real exchanges, what they do is they specifically assign only specific number of uh, connections to each servers because they don't want to overload. And also they try to, instead of looping through each and every connection, instead of looping through each and every connection and broadcasting is they try to broadcast it instead of just looping through because when they loop through the very first connection might get the, um, the 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 tick information or the price information, and then the last connection might get a little slowly. So they don't want to lose out that as well. So they want to receive as fast as possible. There are a lot of strategies over here as well that is out of the subject right now. 